The SS Californian, forever condemned as the ship who watched the Titanic sink, remains one of the most unresolved questions in the iconic narrative of disaster. That night changed the course of Captain Stanley Lord's life forever. Following the sinking, both the American and British inquiries deemed Lord's actions that night to be unprofessional and inconsequential. While no formal accusations were ever brought, the court of public opinion damaged the man's job and destroyed his life. There are other theories about what happened that night, including what could have happened if the Californian had acted. But let's look at the context of that night in 1912. In 1912, wireless operators on smaller vessels, such as the Californian, were not required to stay at their stations overnight. As a result, the Titanic's distress signal was not received. And those missiles launched from the Titanic's deck. The shots were not by the 1912 international rules of the road and hence did not signal anxiety. The Californian captain's failure to respond to the sinking Titanic was not intentional. The Californian's inaction was caused by a lack of wireless radio regulation and inexperienced crew members who followed the rulebook rather than their judgment. As with any catastrophe, several events occurred that night that left us wondering, why? Or, what if? Instead of blaming or perpetuating hypotheses, let's focus on the Californian's history and its role in changing maritime laws. Construction in 1901, the 447-foot-long Californian was unusually large for Dundee, Scotland. She was the largest ship built at the Dundee docks, designed to fit the dock's maximum size. The ship's size grabbed attention from locals, but constructing it in a city with outdated infrastructure presented unique challenges. The weight of the ship's 280-ton boilers on a cart caused damage to the roadways and subterranean water pipes during transportation to the shipyard. In 1901, the Californian was launched, marking a significant milestone for Dundee's shipbuilders originally designed to transport cotton, the ship could accommodate over 100 passengers and crew and reach a top speed of 12 knots. In early 1912, only weeks before the Titanic disaster, the California's first Marconi wireless machine was installed in a renovated cabin. 20-year-old Cyril Evans joined the crew as a wireless operator. Evans, who had only been with the Marconi firm for six months, was on his third journey on the Californian when the Titanic sank on April 14. Ironically, the SS Californian vanished from history not long after its drowning. The ship was sunk during World War I, a fate almost poetic in character, and it has never been recovered. Now, let's discuss about the Californian's timeline. The Californian's timeline, April 15, 1912. What happened on the decks of the Californian that fateful night is forever buried in the abyss of history and time. Everyone involved has long since passed away. What we may deduce is based on testimony given by Californian's captain and officers during the official inquiries, which are the only first-hand accounts of the catastrophe ever produced. The Reconstructed Timeline The Californian radioed the Titanic to warn of an ice field in which she nearly collided with herself. Captain Stanley Lord ordered the Californian to stop for the night, deeming it too risky to continue. As he was leaving work, he noticed the Titanic's lights on the horizon, about five miles distant. The Californian radioed Titanic again, informing them that they had halted and were surrounded by ice. The radio signal was so loud that it disrupted Titanic's routine contact and Titanic replied, Shut up, shut up, I'm busy. At 23.30, the Californian switched down its wireless, 10 minutes later, the Titanic struck the iceberg. The Californian was observed from the Titanic's bridge 25 minutes later, and distress rockets were fired. Officers aboard the Californian noticed numerous rockets and called Captain Lord, who had since gone to bed, to report them. Lord recommended that the Californian contact the vessel by Morse light. No attempt was made to awaken the radio operator. It should be noted that radio was still a relatively new technology in 1912, and many old guard captains had not yet accepted it as indispensable. Lord hypothesized that the rockets were company communications of some sort. The testimony offered during the British inquiry reveals conflicting views regarding the missiles they observed. Some of the Californian officers suspected a more serious motive behind the missiles. At 2 o'clock, Titanic looked to be leaving the area after launching eight white rockets. This was also reported to Captain Lord, but
but he did nothing. At 2.20, the Titanic sank. At 3 o'clock, officials from the Californian reported rockets coming from the south. These were from the RMS Carpathia, which had journeyed from 50 miles away to the Titanic over the night. At 4.16, after a crew shift change, the Californian's wireless operator, who was now awake, inquired as to why a ship had fired rockets earlier. Radio discussion about the Titanic's SOS signal dominated the airwaves. The information was delivered to Captain Lord. At 5.30, Captain Lord, now awake, ordered the Californian to Titanic's position, but instead of a direct course, Lord ordered a convoluted, lengthier route that he would later say in the investigation was to Titanic's last reported position. Californian joins Carpathia, who has just finished collecting all survivors. After Carpathia leaves for New York, Californian remains behind to continue the hunt, only to discover the wreckage. Afterwards, Californian heads to Boston. The Aftermath SS Californian landed in Boston on April 19, 1912, undetected since the world had not yet discovered her value. The United States Senate's American Inquiry, which began the same day of the sinking, learned about Californian's involvement on April 20, when members of her crew, including Captain Lord, leaked claims to the public about sighting the Titanic's distress rockets that night. Lord claimed his ship was 30 miles from the Titanic, but other crew members stated it was less than 20. When reporters pressed Lord, he said the actual location was a confidential state secret. Lord told a contradicting story about why his wireless was down that night. He stated it was due to the nightly shutdown. Other aspects contradicted his crew's claims, such as how long the Californian searched for survivors after arriving at the accident site, how many rockets the crew observed, and its placement relative to the Titanic on that fatal night. The American Inquiry promptly subpoenaed Lord and the Californian crew on April 23, 1912. While the crew's memories were mainly consistent, Captain Lord's were inconsistent and fragmentary. Lord's knowledge of the Titanic's rockets accounted for a significant portion of his conflicting testimony. What he told reporters, what he said in his American evidence, and his subsequent testimony before the British inquiry on May 5, 1912, were all different. He initially denied seeing rockets but then acknowledged seeing rockets from a third ship, not the Titanic. He also publicly rejected testimony provided by the United States Navy and other vessels pinning the Californian within visual range of the Titanic. Californian's logs revealed additional incriminating evidence or a suspicious absence thereof. Its scrap journal, which contains daily trip notes, suddenly disappeared between the night of the accident and the Californian's arrival in Boston. Some have alleged that it was tossed overboard. The official log made no mention of the Titanic, a nearby ship, or any rockets, thereby playing dumb in the face of potential reprisal. Ultimately, both inquiries, independently of each other, found that Californian's position was closer than Captain Lord's assertion of 20 nautical miles, implying that Lord failed to respond correctly. The British inquiry went on to argue that Californian may have saved an untold number of deaths if she had responded swiftly to Titanic's rockets. Legacy Ironically, the Californians' inactivity would cause significant changes to international maritime law. International radio treaties were adopted in 1912, mandating 24-hour radio duty, and later treaties standardized distress flares and rockets, independent of company, vessel, nation, or time of year. The findings of both inquiries, which are on record, formally blamed Captain Stanley Lord of the SS Californian for his passivity during the accident, a verdict that ultimately destroyed both his career and his life. Despite a formal reprimand from both sides of the Atlantic, no criminal charges were ever brought against him in the United States or the United Kingdom. This was owing to the majority of the evidence against him being circumstantial, as well as other legal difficulties. However, the public saw Captain Lord as a coward and incompetent. He was humiliated and despised everywhere he went. His mockery equaled that of J. Bruce Ismay, the disgraced chairman of the White Star Line who notably escaped the disaster. The Leland Line, which owned the Californian, sacked Captain Lord in August 1912 due to negative press. In 1913, one Leland Line board member expressed sympathy for Lord, believing the captain had been made a scapegoat, and was able to get him hired at another steamship firm, Nitrate Producers. 
He remained there until 1927 when health problems exacerbated by social criticism prompted him to resign permanently. The wrecked mariner would spend the rest of his life fighting unsuccessfully to clear his name. Captain Lord had proposed a theory that a mystery third vessel was present that fatal night. In 1958, he requested that the Mercantile Marine Service Association, an advocacy group for seamen, petition the British Board of Trade to reassess the facts. They consented to the case and started the process. This, regrettably, turned out to be a slow process. Captain Lord died before seeing the ruling because he was so sluggish. That same year, the first big-budget film depicting the Titanic disaster, A Night to Remember, was released. This film makes a point of vilifying Stanley Lord as a disinterested skipper who was sleeping in his cozy stateroom when the Titanic went down. While Lord never saw the film, he did read several newspaper reviews that criticized him. It ripped open an old, festering sore that had never healed. A new wave of hatred for the real-life Captain Lord erupted in Britain, eventually leading to the ruined man's demise. Lord died four years later, at the age of 84, entirely broken and devastated. The third vessel theory got a bit of popularity in 1963 when the London Daily Guardian published a story about the SS Samson, a fishing vessel that was illegally collecting sea pellets in the area. According to crew members, they observed rockets on the night of April 15, 1912, but refused to act out of fear of retaliation for their illicit fishing activities. It wasn't until 1965 that the British Board of Trade found Captain Lord's original petition denied, noting Lord's failure to provide new evidence to his favor. Lord's son, Tutton Lord, would spend the remainder of his life, until he died in 1994, working to cleanse his father's name. These efforts were also fruitless. For the next 80 years, official re-examinations of the evidence, including one as late as 1992, in part thanks to Tutton Lord's efforts, all concluded the same outcomes as the initial investigations. Experts, scholars, historians, and filmmakers would condemn Captain Lord in all kinds of media, from books to films. Even 110 years later, social media debates his culpability. Unofficial reinterpretations of the events by historical societies and history aficionados continue to this day. The Californian barely existed for a brief time once her commanding officer was fired. When World War I broke out in 1914, the British government used the ship as a troop transport. In 1915, a German U-boat, U-35, sunk the Californian off the coast of Greece. She sank with one life lost. The wreck has yet to be located.